right, Jeremiah chapter number 33, and we're going to begin in verse number 1. If you would stand with me, this will be your last opportunity to stand. We will read through this section, and it's somewhat of a lengthy section, but I think as we move through it and as we preach through it, I hope that we'll be able to glean the truths that God has for us. It begins in verse number 1. It says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is his name. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city, and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. They, that is, the people of Jerusalem, they come to fight with the Chaldeans, but it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men. In other words, they're not going to have the victory. Whom I have slain in mine anger and in my fury, and for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from this city, that is, Jerusalem. Behold, I will bring it health and cure. Sounds like a completely different scenario that he's talking about. I will bring it health and cure, and I will cure them, and will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return, and will build them as at the first. And I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. And I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have transgressed against me. And it shall be to me a name of joy, a praise, and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them, and they shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Thus saith the Lord, Again, there shall be heard in this place, which ye say shall be desolate, without man and without beast, even in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, that are desolate, without man and without inhabitant and without beast. He's saying, this is what you'll hear in verse 11, the voice of joy, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land as at the first, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, again in this place which is desolate, without man and without beast, and all the cities thereof, shall be an habitation of shepherds causing their flocks to lie down. In the cities of the mountain, in the cities of the vale, in the cities of the south, in the land of Benjamin, and in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, shall the flocks pass again under the hands of them, of him that telleth them, or count them, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days... And at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. This is the name whereof she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want or shall never lack a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. Neither shall the priests, the Levites, want or lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings and to kindle meat offerings and to do sacrifice continually. Father, we ask that you take the word of God and that you would challenge us with what you have for us. Help us to recognize your eternal overarching plan for your glory. And Lord, that we have a part in that. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come to know you. Thank you for what we were able to see this morning realizing your desire for us to come to know you, to experience your grace and your peace, to experience the, the relationship that you desire for us to have. I pray that you would bless in this service, that you would glorify your Son. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we work through this passage, I hope that we can all take a step back and consider God's plan. You say, his plan for what? Well, God's overarching plan for everything. Taking a step back and evaluating life at its core and what God is doing and why the things that happen in my life happen. Why do the things that happen in your life happen? Both the joys as well as the struggles, the triumphs as well as the fears. What is going on in this life and why? 
And it's very clear that people are searching for that answer. They are really trying to make sense of everything that happens in this life. And for, men, for many people, they go to religion. And they think that religion may solve some of the answers to the questions that they face. But religion in and of itself continues to fall short. And there are many questions that people face and wrestle with, and they wonder the whys of life. Why do bad things happen? Why do bad things happen in my life? Why do bad things happen in people that I love in their lives? Why are the things that are happening in life happening? The answer that we are looking for is often the reassurance that everything is going to be all right. Have you ever just been as low as you can be? Maybe things are just not going the way you want them to. And what you really want is someone to put their arm around you and just say, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You know, that, I remember thinking back to childhood. I mean, you know, when things are just bottoming out, you know, friends are, are forsaking you and there's maybe saying things about you or, you know, everything just falls apart. You didn't get the grade you wanted in school or something happens and, and mom or dad comes along and says, you know what, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. And I'm here to say that that is a true statement. Everything is going to turn out all right. But I'm here to say, even though that's true, it may be for a different reason from what you would think or what you would expect. It is going to turn out all right, but the reason that it's going to turn out all right may be different from how we logically would think of it and what we would think all right means. So I know that's a little confusing, but we will understand it hopefully as we move through the message. As we consider these questions of why these things happen in life, let's get into our passages this evening. And the first thing we see is Jeremiah is in a major ter is in major turmoil or in a major predicament. You see in verse number one, it says, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time while he was shut up in the court of the prison. God speaks to Jeremiah while he is in the court of the prison. And this is the second time that God is coming to him and speaking to him while he is in this prison. The first time was just in chapter 32, just one chapter earlier. And in verses 1 and 2, God comes and speaks to Jeremiah while he is shut up, while he is enclosed in the court of this prison. Now, Jeremiah would face worse situations in the near future. You all remember that there was a time when Jeremiah was let down into a pit. This was not just the prison, but in the prison there was a pit. And he was let down into this dungeon or this pit, and, and the mire came up to his knees, and, and he was there for a long period of time, and eventually they, they draw him out of it. I mean, that, that's a pretty rough situation. So Jeremiah, at this point, although he's not as low as he could go, he's still in prison. He's still not able to get out and to go about as he would wish. He would face worse situations, but understand, even so, this is not the best of times for Jeremiah. It's not a party. It's not a picnic. But even in the midst of trouble, God comes to Jeremiah, and he makes a promise to Jeremiah. And what's interesting about God's promise to Jeremiah, and what's interesting about what God says to Jeremiah, is that God does not dwell on Jeremiah's trouble. Does that surprise you? If I were serving God, and I am right now, but if I were serving God like Jeremiah in his day, and I got put into prison, and God comes and talks to me, and of course we're in a different dispensation, and so we don't hear God audibly speaking to us, but, but let's say we're transported back, and I'm Jeremiah, and I'm preaching God's word. They throw me into prison, and God comes and talks to me. You know what I want to hear God say to me? I would want him to say, oh, by the way, I know what's going on. I know you're in prison, and I'm going to take care of everything. Everything's going to be all right in the end. But it's interesting, God doesn't dwell in Jeremiah's trouble. You look at verse number 2. So God comes and talks to Jeremiah while he's in this prison. It says in verse 2, Thus saith the Lord, the maker thereof, the Lord that formed it to establish it, the Lord is his name. And then he gives a promise in verse 4, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah is doing God's work. And he's being faithful about it. Shouldn't God come to Jeremiah and say, don't worry about this, Jeremiah. I'm going to get you out of this prison. I'm not going to let you stay in here. And on top of that, Jeremiah, I'm going to take care of the people that put you here. And I'm going to make sure that they are punished. 
I've seen this a number of times in God's response to his servants. 